worship you today, Father. We worship you today, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you. Easy, I asked y'all for 10 seconds, but I'm going to take my own 10 seconds. Never failed me. You are a promise keeper. You've never left me. No matter how bad it's gotten, you've never left me. God, thank you this morning. Everything is trying to stop the morning, but I'm gonna think I'm gonna stay here for a minute. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to say, I'm going to left here. I worshiped you. I gave you everything that I had. He won't fail. He won't leave me. And I remember seeing it with my own eyes. I remember seeing you do it. And I thank you today. I'm so tired of lazy, selfish church. I cannot get this Francis Chance quote out of my head. It should never, ever, ever be a Sunday when worship is not, is not insane. Like, worship, is, have we ever stopped to think it's not, we're not worshiping you. This ain't about you. We're worshiping God. But if the music messed up, if somebody missed a note, if somebody missed something, our worship was off today. No, if worship was off today, it's because you, he doesn't have a place in your heart. <laughs> worship is a place for coming. The lights can go off, everything, the screen can fall mid-service, and you should still be worshiping. Because if, if you really carry Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, within your stomach, within your bosom, in your, it's always, worship can always be lit. I have worship, sweating in a hundred degree weather, cutting the grass, cut the lawn off, and got on my knees in my front yard. I do not care. What I didn't need a, I didn't need tracks. I didn't need speakers. I didn't need nothing. I had Him, and I had the Holy Spirit. That's all I need. It should never be a Sunday where it's not worship not lit. I'm so tired of us. And I told y'all before, it's my energy for a while. This may not want to be the place for you. Us coming in here, sitting like God owe us something. Like you better make me feel good this morning. And just sitting there looking at him like he just, like, like looking at the worship team or something. Like worship is the only part of this where we give it to him, where we get out of ourselves and worship him. Like it, it should never be a time, ever, where we sitting there looking at him because we're not in the mood. But if somebody gave you a $100,000 check, all of a sudden your emotions change. When, when, when my home's before a touchdown, all of a sudden your emotions change because that's what's in you. It should never be a time when it's time to worship. Everybody ain't sitting up, sitting straight and ready to, because it, it's, it's a theme between you and God. Or you're sitting there saying, you mean more to me than me mean more to me. And I'm not going to let anything, anybody, any place distract what I'm doing with you right now. I, I, be, I remember being there wanting to worship and wanting to pour out. I was like, they're going to see me. My friends, like I invited my friend, well, if she see me crying on my knees, they're going to think I'm weird. I remember that. And I remember getting in time where everybody else was dry, but I was really, I wanted, I, I was about to go crazy, so I kept it in a bottle because I didn't want to distract. It should never be, I screw all of that, bro. I'm, I'm trying to get us to a place of radical worship, like, like unashamed worship. And we come into church every Sunday because we have this restaurant, westernized Christianity, and we jump from church to church to church looking for somewhere that make us feel the best. What makes me feel good? Like the preachers say what I like, like I like it. And the worship team, the music is just the right volume and just the right everything. That's what I like. Or we go somewhere where we can blend in where there's no real true accountability. And we can say we went to church, but nobody, but we not, we really don't have any pressure or any, any uh, uh, accountability to grow. We can just say, well, I won't God. I feel God, I'm gonna go to church. Nah, girl, I gotta go to church. And we gotta get to this place where we have true 
intimate relationship with him. Like, I cannot be the only one that God has been putting on his heart. I, I, he doesn't want to show. Oh, really? The Bible says that we are the temple of the living God. I really want you. I want to be, I want real relationship with my people. I know y'all seen about 17 flyers that come visit us and all these memes and stuff to get you in their church. I know it's become a marketing pansy scheme to get people in the chairs. But, but God is looking for true people who really want him. Like for real are coming to hear him and feel him and to worship him and serve his family and just be out of their self and be part of the body of Christ. I don't know what y'all think we're going to do in heaven. I don't know what y'all think this is going to be like. Worship. We're going to, if we struggle now to worship him because I don't, I, my money and my status and I don't really be doing all of that. I just ain't feeling it today. It's been a long weekend. It's like, who do we think we are? Bro, listen. Y'all will walk into a courtroom in front of a judge and straighten up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, your honor. Yes, sir. Yes, your honor. Y'all walk into a man judge with respect and honor. And we'll walk into in front of God in the presence of God, slouching in, in our seat, got an attitude because we don't we don't have to owe him any reverence or respect because I'm mad or whatever. The, 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 the McDonald's missed your hash brown and your whole morning is gone. And I'm trying to mature to get to the place where, man, I'm walking in church. God, is this is the house of God. I was really thanking God this morning. Like, sometimes I struggle with my flesh. And I'm like, God, it really don't matter what I think or feel. Like, just tell me what you want I'm going to do it. And I'm like, I start thanking God for, for sanctifying me and giving me that heart posture. That I, even if, just because I'm the pastor of the church don't mean I just get to do what I want with the church because I'm the pastor. I go seek God, like, what is it, what you want me to do with this again? And I'm like, God, thank you for blessing me with that heart posture. That to, to understand this is not my church. See, when I'm at home, that belongs to me. If I want to go in the house and just knock everything off the island and just throw everything toast on the floor and walk off to my bedroom, I can do that. Them are my kids. That's my wife. I can do what I want to do. That's my castle. And nobody's going to come into my house and tell me what to do with it. Or I'm going to skew you right out the door. And if you don't want to leave voluntarily, I will move you forcefully. But then we'll walk up into the house of God. What we don't is not ours as leaders and think we can do what we want to just because we can say God told us to leave. When this is not our house, this is literally the house of God. So we should be reverencing him and seeking him in every single choice. What do you want done in your house? Just because I'm the lead manager, don't I don't own nothing. I don't own y'all. I don't own the walls. Y'all give to the church. I take the money and we make the church happen. I, none of it belongs to me. And I, I, I was thanking God for keeping me in a heart posture of, of submissiveness and humility. Because I have to understand I got a house to take care of at home. It, it, this is his to provide for and to take care of. And I was like, thank you, Lord. And he immediately reminded me of, the, see, that's the heart posture I want of worship. And he was showing me, I'm literally sitting there getting ready this morning. And he said, see, when we have a humble heart, that's, indi in, uh, that's indicative of our, of our worship heart. See, one thing why we, we struggle to worship is because we have no true humility. We are, we're our own bosses. We're our own. We, we, we control. It's my life. It's my life. And culture has told her it is your life. Do what you want to do with it. Live your truth. YOLO, you only live once. Do what you want to. Continue to just be and do whatever you want to. Whatever feels good to your nature, do it. I was telling them on Wednesday about a reel I was saying that blew my mind. Two of them that I just, it blew my mind. The first reel, the girl is sitting there, and it's this long thing. You think she's about to say, I was married eight years. It was a great marriage, and he, we didn't argue or nothing, and I just felt, felt like something was wrong, and I just, you know, and I, I thought the end was going to end. Like, the Holy Spirit showed me something great. She ended said, God, I looked over one day after eight years. And God told me, that ain't your husband. So I divorced him and left. I'm like, and then the second one I seen that blew my mind, uh, uh, it, 
was a certain sin that this lady was participating in. I don't want to get into the politics. And then she said, this is my sin. This is my truth. This is what it is for me, but I love God. And the man said, well, in the Bible, it says, she said, no, 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 you can't use the Bible. Because I have a personal experience with him. And if you use the Bible, the Bible is an idol. My personal experience goes over the Bible. Literally, she's made herself her own God. I don't have to obey the word of God. It comes under when any time it contradicts what I feel I've experienced. I don't have to obey it. And if somebody tries to pressure me to, to align myself with the word of God, that's an idol because now we're supposed to follow our feelings. And a lot of us have don't even notice it. Have went right along down the creek. What that I, I my own what, what series have we been in? Today's title is Blind Versus 2020. Bro, you can't see either. And what God has continued to show me, a lot of us live in this mindset and this heart posture that we're our own bosses. We get to win our life. If I want the job, I'm taking it. If I want to date the man or woman, I'm doing it. If I want to go, I'm doing it. I get to control what I want. And if we, some of us have got to the point in God where we'll say the Holy Spirit, God told me to do it. Because we know we believe God. We know God is, is God. So since we don't really want to align with it, we'll just say God told me to do it. God told me to start that or do that. No, he didn't. And we'll say God gave me the dream. Now, that's just was the last thing you was looking at before you went to sleep. God didn't say that. God will never give you anything that goes against his word. I, I, my wife said something years ago, and it stuck with me. It was, I always would tell people, if it goes against his word, that God's not talking, it's not him. She said, but also, if it's easy, it's probably not God either. God, the battle is between your flesh and the spirit. And generally when God is talking, it's going to be something you got to tell your flesh no to or yes to, that it don't want to obey to. So usually, generally, when God is talking to God, has you doing something, it's generally hard because you got to look at your flesh and say, sorry, got to obey my spirit. And it's generally difficult. You, you got a problem with somebody in the church. I'm using this as an example. God just told me to leave. Two things. One, his word says you got a problem with your brother. Go to him. Secondly, it's easy to leave. That, that feels good to you just to leave. But you know what's hard? To have to go to him. So then you have to tell your first sorry, drop your pride, got to go love somebody. See, that's hard. That's how you know God talking. When Jenny is something you don't in your feelings and your flesh want to do. And we got to a point where we're our own God. And then we let ourselves, we let the enemy manipulate us to the point that not only do we want to be our own God, we want to be somebody else's God too. And we want to spit out to them what they need to be doing. When we blind as a bat. I need some help. There's some people in the back. Go in that back row. Who won't mind helping me? Come on, James. I need another man off the back row. There, that work. Come on. Please, please. Now, these guys are asking. I want to help y'all understand this. Put this on. I don't want to mess up your eyes and poke you. It ain't got insurance. Do you see? Okay, let's make sure I want to put it too. <laughs> what do you know? Help me out. Help me out. I don't want to be all mess you up. Okay. Okay. I know you're good. I just really can't. Okay. Can you take them off? We don't need no glasses today. Let me put it on. Yeah, I know. We're going to make you super blind. I want to make it like this. Now put your glasses back on. Like this one? There we go. Now. The life mixes you up, and life turns you around, and life makes your heart, and life does it. So I need you to do something. James, I need you to instruct Jasmine how to get back to her seat. Tell her. How many steps? Talk, tell her, get her back to her seat. <laughs> now, everybody knows she ain't nowhere near close to her seat. But that's about what it looks like. See, we be having all kind of sin and mess in our own life, 
but we'd be ready to start a men's Bible study. We want to help somebody, and we got more mess in our life. See, uh, let me get you to the scripture now. Y'all do not move. I'm not done with y'all. Give me, give me, give me Matthew chapter chapter seven, verse one through six. Watch this. Uh, read it. It says, "Do not see." This is we always say in the Bible, "Don't judge me. Don't judge." That Jesus, this is ready to get. He never said, "Don't judge." He's not. This is not to say, "Don't judge." This is to teach us how to judge. We're going to take this thing off today that we don't judge and we ain't supposed to judge. You are supposed to judge. You're just supposed to judge righteously. He never said don't judge. We'll take one scripture and use it to say to, to do what we want, but we only actually look at the context, read before and after the scripture. Watch what he says here. Don't, treat, don't judge others and you will not be judged. And we stop there and see the Bible say don't judge. But what did it say next? For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. He didn't say don't judge. That was how he intro it. He was trying to teach us how to judge. He says be careful because how you judge others, that's by, by what standard you trying to hold everybody else accountable to? Be careful because that's how I'm going to hold you. He says, he says, he says, verse 3, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye? Let me read it here. I'm trying to look it up. When you have a log in your own eye. Now, I don't know about child and the laws of physics. But if I remember, a log is way bigger than a speck. See, I was work, we was working in the church the other day, and some of that sheetrock stuff fell in my eye. I'm like, huh, huh. It was a speck, but I could still see. I was moving. But if a log dropped in your eye, you blind. Watch what the Word of God says. He says, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of the speck? Let me instruct your life and help you figure it out. He says, when you can't see past a log in your own, oh, watch this, hypocrite. First, he's giving instructions. First, get rid of the log in your own. Get your own life together. He says, then you will see it well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. And I don't know about child, but one thing I really don't like is when somebody's trying to give me instructions and you ain't no better than me. How are you going to tell me how to get a husband? Yours didn't even work, and it was because of you, but you're going to instruct me about how I'm supposed to date. How are you going to help me lose weight? You're going to give me financial advice. And then, oh, this is what it is. See, we think because we did it good one time in our life, now we qualified to start a podcast and tell everybody else about it. Just because you scored 25 in high school don't mean you can be a coach now. We we'll did it right one time in our life and think now we have enough to say that we should be instructing somebody else. He says, first you hypocrite, first get the log out of your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. He said, then you will see well enough to help somebody else. See, we cannot avoid judgment. If somebody say you don't judge, just say, why are you judging me for judgment? Y'all done made a thousand judgments just getting up this morning. How many y'all, y'all know how many times I try to figure out what to wear today? I'm like, can I wear red in the pulpit like this? They laugh at me. Like, I made judgment calls all the way to church. What I was going to eat for breakfast, what I'm not going to eat. What I'm not going to do, how I'm going to speak to this person. We, you, you can't avoid making judgments. He says, just do it the right way. He says, all y'all are designed to hold each, you know, each other accountable. We're about to get there. But the fact that we just think, I, thank y'all. I mean, I, I was going to do some more, but I, I want to go some more. Thank you. I just don't, I'm just. The fact that we think we have the right. See, this is the thing. We all need accountability. We have gotten to a culture where accountability, some of y'all are not good friends. That's my friend. She can say, girl, tomorrow I'm going to get on a clip and jump and fly to California. You buy, yes, girl. I got to support my friend. Yes, girl. Some of y'all are really not good friends. Here, if you can, if, this is how you judge if you got a good friend or not, if they're good friends or not. If they can, you can go in front of them and just sin, and they don't say a word. If you can go in front of them and say, girl, I'm about to go sleep with dude. I ain't had nothing so long. Girl, it's been a month. I just, I got to I gotta get a fix. It's been a minute. I, I done waited six months. God ain't said my husband yet. It's been six months, six months. Wow. And he ain't said my husband yet. So, I, girl, I just, I got to do what I got to do for myself. And then they like, I understand, girl. I said, I got mine. That's not your friend. 
That's not a friend, that's baggage. Because they're not willing to hold you accountable. I can guarantee you with something in your life that you're doing that they're benefiting from. That's baggage. And when you stop doing the thing that made y'all like that she benefits from, then she'll leave you. He'll leave you. When I was in the streets chasing chicks, I had all the homies ever. And since I had the money in the cars and I attracted a lot of them, they wanted to be around me because they could just get out of friends. But the minute I said, I'm actually married, I don't do that no more. I'm actually going, I'm going home with my wife. They don't call. They don't talk to me. Like, I don't nobody call me. But when they stop benefiting from my sin, they, they, they realize, you, you will really see how much, how close some friends are when you stop kicking it. When you say, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to pursue God. See, this is how you judge if you got good friends or not. You can go in their in they presence and just relentlessly sin, and they don't say nothing. And they'll, they'll say, this, I don't get in her business. That's my friend. I don't get in her business because that's not a friend that's baggage. See, this is the thing. We need accountability. We, 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 we can't do this life. I, I want to keep, let me, don't give me back to Matthew. I got to give you Bible because I don't think I'm just ranting. Verse 6 in Matthew 7, NLT. Don't watch this. Verse 5, hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you be well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Y'all supposed to hold each other accountable. Y'all supposed to deal with each other's specs. He said, but you get the law got your off first. Verse 6. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. And I was like, God, that makes no sense for you to start talking about don't judge. Judge wisely. Get the speck and log at your own eye. And then immediately talking about some don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. Then, then they, they trample with they trample, they will trample the pearls and turn around and attack you. I'm like, what does that mean? Why would you put that there? That makes no he said, No, look again. So I look, I read again. I said, Lord, Holy Spirit, show me. He said, No, no, no. He said, Here you go. Stop wasting what's holy on people who just don't want to be holy. Stop trying to see some of y'all don't want to get rid of the friend. I'm going to just save her. I'm going to save my relationship. I don't want to leave my dude. We ain't saved. No, no, no. He says, he says, stop wasting what is holy on people who are unholy. Some of y'all got friends who just don't want to do right. And they're not going to do right. They have made it clear. Girl, that's for you. That ain't for me. He said, and you'll be trying to get them. And after they told you, I don't want to hear that. He says, stop wasting what is holy. He says, the reason why I want you to stop. He gives you the reason. He says, they will trample over it. First, they will disrespect you. I ain't never had that friend. You say, D ain't the one. You need to stop. You just hate it because you ain't got a man. Uh, girl, I'm out of here. They'll turn around and attack you. They'll, they, they, they'll trample over your words and your wisdom and then attack you saying that you, you ain't never trying to help somebody and, and be, be the peacemaker and they're attacking you. He said, stop wasting, remove yourself. He said, remove yourself. And too often we do this a little too long. Yes, love in verse Corinthians chapter 13 always hopes, always perseveres, but love ain't foolish. You're supposed to pray for your, your brother and sister in Christ. You're supposed to pray for that thing, that marriage, that thing that's failing, and go hard for it. But at some point, you got to back up because you got it. Now, God, it's a certain level. When they attack you, he said, now I need you to protect you. So I need you to back up and, and, give, and let me deal. And some of us who have friends who can separate ourselves need to. And some of us can't separate ourselves. We married. We end this now. God, don't divorce me. God said divorce you because you, you trampling over my words. No, no. Then you just back up and say, Lord, I'm giving this to you. He said, stop doing that. Because I, and, and I had to, some years ago, a pastor told me of a, a mega church in the city. He was a good mentor to me. He said, he said focus on the fat people. He said, if I can give you anything, I've been pastoring 10 years. If I can give you anything, he said, listen to me. And I started, when somebody's talking, I, I'm teachable. I started listening when somebody's talking, mentor or not. You can teach me putting me on game. I'm, cause I, I don't know it all. He said, I wish 10 years ago I would have I would have went from, from oh, I forget it. What's the word he told me, Pastor Joy? Uh, from, um, not consuming, from um, campaigning. Oh, he said, I wish I went from campaigning to pastoring a lot sooner. He said, when we start the church from scratch, we start this brand new thing, and I'm in this mode trying to prove to everybody how far the church is, and it's a loving, good place. I was campaigning, trying to show everybody this is a good place for you. He said, I wish I went from campaigning to pastoring way sooner. He said, because what's happening is now when you campaign for so long to people, they get bottle fed, and they want you to keep bottle feeding them five, six, seven years in. He said, it's my fault because all I was campaigning them, and I was carrying them at first. Try to show them that I love them and show them it's just a good place for them. He said, but I realized something. 
you cannot turn disengaged people into exciting people. He said, you will drain yourself doing it. He said, I need you to go focus on the fat people. Faithful, available, and teachable. He said, I wish I'd have spent all my time on the fat people because the other people left anyway. He said, all these years, they're gone anyway. He said, I wish I'd have spent all my time and focus on the fat people. And God reminded me of that. So lately, I've been fat people focused. Who's faithful, available, and teachable. Because you cannot turn disengaged people into exciting people. And I'm trying to learn that. I'm like, in 2025, I'm going fat crazy. Like, I'm out of my campaign mode. We hit four years. Y'all get it now. This is a great church to be in. It's cool. But I'm going into a mode where I need my soldiers. I need my SWAT. And we're going to go tear the enemy head off. And everybody else that don't want to be around, and they, and they, and they I, 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 my wife is my master filter. And I put in the church app the other day. I'm like, I ain't seen half a hour in months, in several weeks. I said, now don't pop up at the way fix. I'm looking at these tickets like we got about 40 tickets reserved by people who ain't been in church in weeks, months. I said, don't pop up at the way fix. Talking about some, hey, it's cool in here, Pastor. I'm like, you ain't been. Like, see, normally they don't do that because you can't offend nobody. You can't hold nobody accountable. You don't want to hurt them. And I'm like, oh, screw that. It's time for us to be mature. God said this year to go hard, humble, aware, resilient, and disciplined. And if I want pastor to let you just trickle through church doing whatever, when he gave us a mandate this year to be disciplined, sorry, I'm going to offend you, but yeah, I, and, and, and I'm going to tell you this now. I ain't saying it in a while. Yes, I did just remember this. We all, I get this thing sometimes. Like, is he talking about me? I am. If what I say hits you, I'm literally talking about you. The whole point is for me to stand here, give you something that hits you, and you say, ow, I need to get better. I, I, I'm not here for fuzzy messages. You may have to go somewhere else for that one. I'm not going to say bring tomorrow. The blessing coming, and get ready, and the favor of the Lord is outside the door in your front seat, and I'm not doing that. Because I know how you get the blessings in the favor of God. It's by lining up and being obedient. So if I can get you to understand, uh, 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 to get holy and sit with God and give him your life, the other stuff just don't, Matthew 6.33, seek ye first. And all the other stuff will be added. If I can get you to seek first. See, we want to skip past seek first and go to add it. And, and, and honestly, some of us in our pulpits are willing to just preach add it in addition, in addition, in addition to your life. And nobody wouldn't have preached subtraction. You got to subtract some stuff. It's called repentance. You got to take some stuff out that ain't God to get the good stuff in. And if I skip past and make you feel good every week, and you're like, I got this fire church, and you always be cool, and it's always great, and you really have no spiritual goal, then the, the sky crack, you go to be with the Lord, and you stand there in judgment, but because you believe him, he's going to accept you, but because you live the whole life that's worth nothing, he's going to say, well, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 16, he said, the builder himself will be saved. He said, but he would suffer great loss. What a life that you lived, believing in Jesus, and it was literally pointless. You never lived yourself up to be a kingdom vessel. You just lived and kicked it and did your job and did your career and did all this stuff and hang with your friends and travel and post pictures, and I never got to participate in any of it. All that was for you. You never gave me anything. I never got your time. I never got your talent. I never got your treasure. And you made an excuse why you couldn't serve me, why you couldn't give to me, why you couldn't come. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, I mean, I'm cool. I'm your God. I'm your God. I still love you. See, our salvation is not based on what we do for him. Our salvation is simply based on what he did for us. But our sanctification, and why, and that's based on what we do back for him. Like, I, I, our blessings and favors based on what we give back. He said, I saved you for eternity, but based on how you love me and live for me, that's based on how our relationship go and how this go. He said, we're going to stand there, and our whole life will mean nothing. And I'm sorry, I will not stand before God. He said, I trusted you with a church. Why didn't you hold him accountable? Why didn't you push him? Why didn't you make him uncomfortable? Why didn't you get in my word, and you seen something going on in the church, and you didn't smack it with the text? Why did you sit there and let it ride? I'm like, well, because Pastor, I just wanted, I didn't know it. I just thought I was it. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm going to stand here and if he gives me something as uncomfortable as it may be. 
we all got to eat it because I promise you, it's not one sermon, maybe one. I give myself one that I've never preached. Maybe I have sermons on giving because I, that's my heart. But besides that, every other sermon I've ever prepared, it is tearing me apart while I'm giving it to you. Ask my wife, Pastor Jordan. They're the two I talk to the most during the week, and I'll be sitting there on the couch like, dang, I got to preach this to them, but I got some problems, bro. I, I didn't, they got my attitude. I be judging many of the people sometimes. And I got I can't preach this to them before I get repented. And I had to spend the week getting repented. And then turn around, that's why I can preach it with such conviction. Because I've sat there and dealt with myself in it all week. So now I'm like, I'm free. Let's get free together. Let's get repented together. So what, what I'm, I'm saying that to say, I don't give you stuff for fun. I've had to, I, I am under the same level and standard of righteousness and right living that you are. The only difference between you and me is I stand up here to preach. Y'all supposed to be out there and preach. There's no difference. My only job is to help teach it to you. Everything, I, to be very honest, y'all got the same job I got. What did he do? What was the Great Commission? To go make disciples. He told them all that. And if what happens is that I go make 10 disciples and they go make 10 disciples, everybody disciple makers. I don't want y'all just coming here feasting and getting good word and then turn around and say, that was good and go home and get ready for another one next week. At some point in time, you should be ready to, to not feast, but to provide a meal for somebody else. You should be in there cooking. Uh, uh, you should be in there getting ready to serve your homegirls. Your whole posse is supposed to be at church right now because of you. Because they see you cooking. It's like, man, she changing. She different. Either they going to run from you or they going to bite. I'm going with her. I love, I see her change and I can't believe she's changing. It's like, it's supposed to be a point. There's no difference between me and you. I'm not giving us this to, 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 to cook us and to make us upset. It's, oh, we got to get better. We have to get to the point where we really want God and we really want what he, we got, we got our thirst for him and thirst for holiness and thirst to be for to please him and, and thirst that he's happy with us and, and yes our flesh hurts but just thirsting like he's happy with me I did what I was supposed to do this hurts I'm horny I want to smoke weed but my spirit is happy right now like but my flesh is mad but my God is pleased like we got to get to a point where, where our spirit is stronger than our flesh like we have to grow and thirst for God past ourselves watch he says he says I got to give it to you another, I got to give it to you, I got to get, I don't, amplify, same scripture, uh, uh, Matthew 7, he says, do not do not judge and criticize and condemn others unfairly with an attitude of self-righteous or superiority as though assuming the office of a judge. Watch how he's teaching us to judge, same scripture, just a different version, so that you would not be judged unfairly. He says, for just as you hypocritically judge others, you, when you are sinful and unrepentant, so will you be judged. And in accordance with the standard and measure used to pass our judgment. How you give it, you're getting it back. Judgment will be measured to you. Verse 3, why do you look at the insignificant speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice and acknowledge the uh, uh, egregious? There you go. I don't know why that just didn't come to me. Log in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me get the speck out of your own eye, when there's a log in your eye? You hypocrite. Play actor, pretender. I had to read this version just for that part. And too much time we're in church play acting and pretending from the pulpit down. Playing right in the pulpit. And wonder why the crowd is playing because the leaders are playing. Pretending. Y'all didn't see? Oh, uh, we ain't live. Cool, I can say it. Dang, we are going to be live. We're going to record this. I was watching last week at this, this, this minister that went viral. And he had this man come up there and open his mouth. Ah. Y'all see it? And he got the oil and just slammed his hand down his mouth. Come here, Pastor Jordan. <laughs> Give me that oil. Oh. See, the blessings of the favor of the Lord need to come upon you. Come on, Pastor. Obey the bishop. Because the Lord wants your lips to be new. See, what is that? Why would I ever ask a man to come up and put oil on my mouth and put my hand down his throat? Because we play acting pretending, and then it's happening in the, in the pews. Because a, fog, a, a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pew. Like what happens up here from the leadership will show up in the, in the members and the followers. What games are we playing, play actor and pretender? That's not God. We always talk about decency and order. Tell me where's order in that. Tell me, tell me what, what blessings were God trying to receive? Did he need a new tongue? Did his teeth need to be straightened? Like what, what were we trying to accomplish? 
And this is the games that we play in the pulpit. And we'll justify it or say that it's, it's God, it's the Holy Spirit. No, it's not. This is why people do not like church no more. Because of the games that they witness on social media, they're like, I'm cool on the whole thing. I'm not, no, I'm good. They play, I, y'all see that and they laugh in the comments. Literally, people say, this is why I don't like church. This is why I don't go, I stay at home. Because of the games that we play. Trying to put on a show to get y'all to come back. He says, first get the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, for they will trample under your feet and turn to, turn to pieces. Last verse, I got to get a message verse. It get gooder. Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures. Criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has always has, has our way of boomeranging. He says, it's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when you have a face that is distorted by contempt? Is the whole, is this whole traveling road show mentality all over again, playing harder than thou part instead of just living your part? He says, wipe that ugly sneer off your face, your own face, and you might be fit to offer a wash call to your neighbor. We got two points today. I'm about to get us out of here. Point one, yes, you are to judge righteously. We are, it's two points. Yes, you are to judge, but righteously. Like, I, I want to keep exchanging this word judgment for accountability. Like, we, we have to hold people accountable in the house of God. Oh, God, I'm hot and I'm just, because we about to do this. Give me First Corinthians chapter 5. This is the words where I'm going to give y'all a word. I can hardly believe the report about sexual immorality going on among you. Something that even pagans do. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. This is in the church. This is a letter to coin to a church. He said, I'm told, I'm hearing that this is going on in the church. He said, I was hearing that sexual immorality is running rampant in the church. And not just any sexual morality. Y'all got the stepsons rock with his mama? Like, he, says, he says, verse 2, you are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Yes, it's called excommunication. You can be asked to leave a church. Just like you can get put out of Walmart, you can get put up out of here. I've had to do it once before, and it broke me. My pastor told me you should have been, did, got, did, t- took care of this. And I just didn't want to do it, because I was just don't like going there. But uh, one thing I will, I'm going to go there. When I start seeing division and people messing with other people and it's calling division, I, that's when I change from happy, cool pastor. There's a guy hope that everybody's going to come around to get up out of here. He says, he says, verse three, even though I'm not with you in person, I'm mean with you in spirit. And though I was, and, and, and though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man. He said, I've already, I've already had to pass judgment on the behavior of the man. I thought we weren't supposed to judge though. Paul said, but I've already passed judgment. I'm not even there. I'm just hearing the reports. And if this is true, I've, I've already gave what needs to happen in this situation. He says, he says, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus, you must call a meeting at the church of the church. And I and I will present with uh and I will be present with you in spirit, and so with the power of the Lord Jesus. Then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan, so this hand, so this sinful nature will be destroyed, and him and he himself will be saved by the day of, by the day of the Lord's return. He said, "We don't throw him out just to be cool and try to be mean." He said, "Hopefully, when he sees him outside the body of God, the body of Christ, if you want to sin, fine, but this can't be allowed here. We can't allow sin here. Hopefully, prayerfully, he will get it." And he'll be saved before the Lord's return. Hopefully the enemy will kick his butt enough that he'll submit to God, realize what he's doing wrong, repent, and then he can come back. Watch what he says here. Verse 6. You're boasting about this is terrible. You, do you, don't you realize that this is sin? Is that like a yeast? Watch this. It's like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. You put a little bit of yeast in there and come back, that whole thing going to be rose up. He says sin will spread through like wildfire. He said, don't you understand this little bit of sin? In the, it was that little bit of sin like yeast? And when you put it, it will spread through the whole batch of dough. Don't you understand we allow this type of immorality in the house of God, how it was spread? 
Don't y'all know how sometimes y'all don't be understand why other stuff is happening, but because something over here is happening. So then everybody in the church pregnant. But how we just got a season of pregnancies. Because everybody has been laying up and the pastor didn't say nothing about it. The pastor didn't convict nobody of it. And we just allowed it and then spreading. That spirit is just spreading. He said, Don't you know that little it's just a little, it's like yeast? It'll ruin an entire batch of dough. Watch what he say. He said, verse 7, get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ in the Passover lamb has sacrificed. So he says, you'll be like a new batch of yeast. Like Christ, what Christ did for you made you new. Like you shouldn't be having this in your life. He said, verse 8, so let us celebrate the festival, not, not with old bread of wickedness and evil, but with new bread of sincerity and truth. When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with the people who indulge in sexual sin. He said, bro, that's very heavy. Didn't I tell y'all before, stop allowing this type of mess? Didn't I tell y'all before, stop allowing sexual sin? Don't y'all know how dangerous it is? He says, he says, verse, verse uh, 10, but I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin. Watch it. We, we about to, this is what I want to get us to. Or greedy or cheap, uh, he said, uh, sexual sin. Or are greedy or cheap people or worship idols. He said, you would have to leave the world to avoid people like that. That's where I want to get to his last three verses, his last two verses. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges. Now I made a mistake. Indulges. Well, I'm already pregnant. I'm going to just keep, you can't get no pregnant there. So I just, I mean, this last nine months, just, ah. like, let's just keep going. I mean, I already messed it up. I already messed up and messed with her. So I might as well keep it going. I mean, open door for me. I already messed up, so let's just keep indulging. Let's just keep staying in it. We, we talking about sex here. He said, and I was, I was spending like, God, why are we talking about sex? Like, what, what's the point of this? Like, he said, oh, no, it's something floating. Oh, I don't know y'all business, but Holy Spirit do. And if I were to ask how many unmarried people has been, um, um, or married, don't matter, has been faithful in either, uh, what's it called when you don't have sex with a single? Celibate. Oh boy, I don't think we can get past a month for too many of us. That has been celibate and actually honoring God with our bodies. And I don't have to know your business just to feel it. And have we even repented? Because I, I, I think we got about 30% of the house married. And probably the people that's not married have more sex than the married. I, I'm dead serious. This is a, this God wants us to be holy. And we keep falling into mess because we keep opening up our legs and dropping our boxes. And then six months, seven months later, we begging me to help you get out of it. Get me out of this house. I'm tired of this relationship. He's crazy. She's crazy. If you just would have honored God, I'm going to move on. He, said, I mean, he says, to associate with, with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worship idol. It's not just sexual sin. He said, watch. Or, make sure these stage monitors are off. Claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worship of idols or is abusive or is drunkard or cheats people. He said, everybody who just indulges in that kind of lifestyle, didn't I tell you? Stop. He says, don't even eat with such people. I don't care that's your favorite brunch partner. Anybody who lives this sort of lifestyle, he said, not unbelievers. You got to get out of this whole world to avoid that. He said, I'm talking about believers. See, this is a letter to Corinth, not to anybody outside the church. He's talking to people in the church. He says, it is, isn't it my responsibility to judge others? It isn't my responsibility to judge others outsiders. Judge outsiders. He says, but it certainly is my responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. See, we got to stop this thing. See, we're going to leave here today and understand that we are the judge. He said, it's my responsibility to judge what's in the house of God. See, other people, let God judge them. That is not us. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. But when you come into this faith, there's a standard of holiness. And we got to keep each other accountable to the standard. If we're if we going to just bring the world right into the church, I mean, what you need a difference for? 
He said it should be a standard in the house of God where it just don't happen. And I've struggled sometimes. I've had plenty of people that I know about it, that God prayed in this church, everything, and I've never said a word. I've struggled with it sometimes. I'm like, am I supposed to? And I've talked to my elders and my leaders, like, and I'm like, that's cool. Like, but at some point, y'all, I'm going to start saying something. Because if I drop the standard of God because I just don't want to deal or say nothing, and so I, like, I just want to av- avoid it, you know what I'm saying? So I'm going to just be cool. No, y'all, it's a st- we have to have a standard in the house of God of holiness. And I can't change. I didn't set that standard. He set it. We have to uphold it. I know I talk a lot about grace and salvation is free. It is. We're going to end this today with that. But what is not free, as I tell you all the time, is sanctification. Sanctification is just simply means being set apart for special use. When we come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ and give him our life, we're supposed to strive to be set apart. I'm not like the world. I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning up my life, but I don't look like the world. He says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body. Huh? What did it say? A living sacrifice. Watch this. Holy and acceptable. Because holy is the acceptable standard. He said, now, I don't just present the body anything. I want a holy one. He said, that's your reasonable service. That just makes the most sense. If I die for you, the least you can live for me. That's the standard when we come into the love of God is to start to pursue holiness and pursue holiness and pursue pleasing God. We can't just say I'm saved. That, that he, the writer of Hebrews said you shouldn't just stay a baby forever. You ought to be teaching by now. He said, but I'm still talking about the gospel, trying to explain to you how you saved through salvation. Even the Bible, even the writer of, of Hebrews, who I, I think is Paul, we don't know, is, is frustrated. He's like, we still, I'm still trying to teach you how you saved by grace. Y'all still can't let go of the fact that Jesus died the cross of your sin is not sin that puts you to hell, but the, his love. We still talk about that. We still on milk. You can't, I, I can't even move you down to nothing else because you still need to understand who you are in Christ. It's a standard of holiness and I can't change. And yes, I'm holding you accountable. Yes, these leaders are going to be in your mouth, in your face. Why? Because that's the standard of God's house, and we don't get to change it. Watch, he says, it isn't my responsibility, verse 12, to judge outsiders, but it certainly is my, your, respons- your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. I, I knew I would underline that, so I read, read. He says, watch this, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it's certainly your responsibility. See, we're supposed to hold each other accountable to the faith that we put in. It's supposed to be, a, a, we all supposed to not have the same zero tolerance in pursuit of holiness. The church is supposed to say, no, this is not cool. Some stuff shouldn't even make it to me. Y'all should be like, all right, talk to her. That ain't cool, Pastor. I'll pray with her, and we're going to work through that thing because it ain't cool. And we ain't trying to live like that. We ain't trying to dishonor God. We're trying to get better in these streets. And I'm like, thank you, guys. Right, let's move. Because if we're going to continue to pursue God and pursue holiness, he says, God will judge, verse 13, the last verse, God will judge those out the, on the outside. But as the scriptures say, you must remove that evil person from among you. Last point. We need accountability. Verse point one, yes, you are to judge for righteousness. Point two, last point, we need accountability. If God, if holiness is our goal, and we fight our flesh every day, who is, where is your accountability? Here's my question for today. Who in your life has the power to check you? Like, really think about it. Who in your life, when they say something, you're going to check you, you stop in your tracks and change? Because some of us going to struggle to find anybody. But if they told you, you, you cool, you shouldn't be doing it, that that would change. Where's the mentorship and accountability in your life? Who can say something to you in your life? Man, and you buck, but they can check you with the word of God that you know is true, and you submit. If our goal is to get better for Christ, who in your life is designed to keep you in check? Because if we're honest, a lot of us avoid accountability. We avoid that person that we know going to get in our stuff. Because we don't want to hear it, I just want to stay in my mess. We're comfortable in sin. We're just comfortable in the mess, so we avoid church. We avoid anybody going to talk about church. We avoid anybody going to say anything, like, so we can sit in our mess. He says, he says, who in your, who in your life has had, and I, I, I put this in here for a reason, even I have accountability. 
I, I, I have people that have the power as a pastor to keep me in check. It is no different for me than it is for you. I got executive leaders. It's been, <laughs> it's been so many times. Pastor Jordan and Pastor King are like, mm-mm. Right, pastor, we know we don't be saying nothing, but that ain't it. I'm like, dang, let me change up. Sometimes I go back to them if I feel like God want me to do it. But even sometimes they know they're hearing from God, so they come out like, now, nah, Pastor, I'm telling you that that didn't come right. And sometimes if I still don't get it, you know what they'll do? They'll go pray. And eventually I come tell them, they're like, yeah, I've been praying about that. You was tripping. I'm like, no, I didn't see it. <laughs> Thank you. Even I have the power to be checked. Pastor, and these executive leaders are just there for show. They have the ability to pull my coattail. The elders of the house, Mama Cynthia, Mama Lucille, Tony, Tasha, Jacqueline, Kanisha B. Like, these are people around me that when they see me slipping, and see, this is the thing, a lot of times I just said it, they won't even say nothing. They'll just go pray like, Lord, I know he has your heart. I know his heart. I'm going to just go talk to you about this. Reveal it to pastor that he's tripping. And a lot of times, because I truly love God and I have his heart, I'm trying to listen, he'll talk to me for them. I, I bet you they can raise their hands. They've been praying about something. Don't raise your hands. You know, you're right. They prayed about something that they seen me doing, but felt I shouldn't tell. I'm not going to address that to him verbally. And they see me address it or change it later. That's what they're for, they're to keep me accountable as a leader. And I leave that open door for it. A lot of times when I make big decisions or anything that affect the church, I'll go to them and seek counsel. Seek it. I pulled Tony and Tasha to the side before. I've been pulling Jordan, Anthony, and Ken about the side about everything that I got to make a choice on that can be controversial. I go check in and get different perspectives because guess what? God put them there. So I accept rebuke. I accept it. Where in your life do you put a person there, you put them there, and you say, when they say I'm wrong, I'm on it. When they check me, when they say I'm on it. Y'all heard baby cry before. Look this way. Where in your life have you set that person that has a job to keep you straight? Last verse. I want to give you an example of accountability of the Bible. I just want to give you an example of it. I'd, I'd like to give you a Bible to back. And, and you need these scriptures later. Hit the Bible app. Hit the three little say Hit events and go save it so you can look at it later. Galatians chapter 2, our last text, and we're going to get out of here. Go watch the Chiefs get the swirl. No, I get a, I rebuke you, Satan. <laughs> hey, no, we got, I rebuke you, Satan. So we got to, no, you know what? I need to have an executive staff meeting at the church. We need to have a, the choice to not accept, because we got Bills fans and Steelers fans and Broncos. We need to have an executive meeting about they are not allowed. He said, remove this person from among you. <laughs> we don't do that. Are we about to have a red Sunday coming up? No, we are not dealing with y'all. It's y'all black and blue. No, the blue. These, that's the Bills fan in the back. Am I red? No. You're not over us. They're not like that. Okay. Galatians 2, chapter 11. Let's get, let me get you out of here. Seriously. This is an example. Remember, point one, we are to judge, but righteously. Point two, we need accountability. Now watch this. I want, let me show you to you. Verse 11, Galatians 2, 11, NLT. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face. For what he did was very wrong. Now watch this. This is Peter. This is the Petra. This is who God left the church with. Paul, you just came and you went with us when we were with Jesus. Paul's writing this letter to Galatia. He wrote this letter to the Galatia, and he gave them an example of how he had to check Peter. Now watch this. Peter, been a, he was a disciple. One of the first ones. He walked with Jesus. He miracles with Jesus. did miracles for Jesus. He bred 20,000. He fed 20,000. He fed 15,000. He's boat rocking. He's walking on water. Only one ever walked on water with Jesus. And Paul said, I had to check him. This is the one that who Jesus said, you the, the God must have told you that. I'm put, God told you that because you didn't hear that from man. I'm going to leave you my, I'm going to build my church on you, Peter. And Paul said, I had to check him. Now at this point, Paul was persecuting the church. He just got saved. And what I wanted to point out about this is sometimes it's just because you got more years in it. Does not mean you more mature. Oh gosh. 
We have had people who were sitting in church for 20 years and been saved since they was 20 and now they're 45, 50. But think that can't nobody that just got saved and they're 22, now they're 24, can tell them something. And honestly, if I'll be very honest, you spent 20 years saved and, and 19 been pointless. They've been saved for two years and been knowing the true gospel and been living it for the whole two years. They got more spiritual status than you. But we'll reject wisdom from them. But, but Peter got checked and had to receive it and eat it. Why? Because he said, dang, that's the word, and I know I was wrong. And accepted uh, somebody who wasn't in it as long as him, somebody who didn't spend no time with Jesus, somebody who persecuted Jesus, check the person who's been with him the whole time. I just stopped there because we got to get rid of this because I'm 65. I can't listen to nobody that's 20. That, you would be a fool to pass out on some dope wisdom because you're just too old. And they too young. What them youngers know? Half this church is young and they just spit some fire to you. Because they really love Jesus and been walking with him since they were 19, 18, 20. And they 25 now. They got six dope, two, six years in the game. Day to day with him. Day to day serving. You just start. Okay, I'm, y'all get it. Verse 12. When he arrived, he said, I had to, I had to, I had to oppose him face to face, but he was very wrong. Verse 12. When he first arrived, he ate the, with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some of the Fran, some of the France of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of this uh, criticism for these people who insisted on the necessity of uh, circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barabbas, Barnabas, was led astray by the hypocrisy. He said, you were sitting there eating pulled pork sandwiches, bacon, BLTs, beans with the pork smoked, and chilling and eating with them and getting down. And the minute your Jewish brother came, the church people showed up, that insisted on circumcision, what he said is they insisted that you believe in Jesus and keep the law. He said, no, 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 no. We, we don't, the law is no more. Jesus fulfilled the law. We put our faith in Jesus. We are free now. Eat your pork and the Sabbath. We don't need to keep a Sabbath no more. He is the Sabbath. Jesus is our day of rest. We don't need to chill on Saturday and Sunday anymore. He literally is our rest. And we, we spit out all these rules and all these people still say we need to do all this stuff. And Paul said, no. He said, I had to oppose him face to face. He says, he says, watch this. When he first came, he said, we, uh, uh, he said, verse 14, he said, when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel, uh, we close it. When I seen they weren't following the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of all the others. He dealt with him right in front of everybody else. And most of them, did he try to front me? He gonna try to do it when everybody was in the hallway. I remember back in the old days, the parents said, well, you show out. That's what we're going to deal with. You in the store tripping? Let's go then. He dealt with him right in front of everybody else, face to face in his face, strong rebuke, right there in front of everybody else. He says, when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel, he said, I said it to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew of birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are being like the Gentile, why, would you not, why, why, why are you now trying to make the Gentiles follow the Jewish tradition? He said, you get this. You understand we discarded the laws now because of Christ. We don't have to stick to that. Why are you now trying to follow him in front of and show up, put a front on in front of the church people, for the old Jewish brother? He says, verse 15, you and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like Gentiles. He said, me and you are Jewish people. I've had debate after debate about Gentile just means somebody who's not following the law. Gentile, you are Jews by birth, not sinners like Gentiles. That's, that is talking about a race. It's not talking about a type, disobedient people. It is non-Jewish people or Gentiles. If you are not a Jewish bloodline, you are a Gentile. We are. Gen- I am a Gentile. I, I, I'm not. I was not born under that law. Under all that, I wasn't. I'm not of the blood of the. I'm not. We are. Uh, uh, we, I wanna, we're Gentile people. Verse sixteen. Yet we know that a person is made right with God. Yeah. Let me break the gospel down again because you just messed it up to the Gentile people that was watching us. You jumped up and didn't eat with them no more and went back to the law when your friends got there. When you were just, now they think, now they're following your hypocrisy. Now you've led people astray from the true gospel. Let me restate this thing up. He says, he says, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. You were made right with God by faith, not by keeping the law. He said, I had to go re- rearrange it because they think, well, you got to keep the laws and be circumcised and do all this stuff again. And that's the only way you can get God. He said, that's a lie. You messed up the gospel. He says here, when I seen the, God, the truth of the gospel message was being tainted, I jumped up. He says, 
Yet we are know that a person made right was by, by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. How many times do we have to preach this for y'all to let it go? The law is no good when it comes to salvation. It cannot save you. Keeping the rules and not sinning does not save you. Only by faith in Jesus Christ we are saved. Keeping the law is now so we can have a relationship and favor and blessings. And Jesus sanctified. Holiness is important, but when we talk about salvation, we can't pay that price. We're all sinners. You can't pay for some of you guilty of it. A perfect lamb had to come, Jesus Christ, to pay that bill, which he did. So we get salvation by belief in him for free. It's a free gift of grace that no man can boast. But we are to live holy. He says, he said, let me read, get this, this honest thing. He said, let me get this gospel right. He said, and we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ. We may be right with God the Father by our faith in the Son because his Son is now given all power in heaven and earth. He's how we do it. He says, not because we have obeyed the law. He says, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. If you never sin again from this day forth, you still don't deserve heaven. It don't matter. You still sin if you sin just once. The Bible says if you broke one of the laws, you're guilty of them all. If you got, if you got an all-white outfit on, white shoes, white socks, white pants, white t-shirt, we did. And I come over and put my finger in some hot fudge and come over and just say, Boop, and poke you. The whole outfit messed up. It only takes one. If I hang you off the ceiling by a 10 link chains, 10 laws, which one got to break for you to fall? Any of them, pick one. You're going down. He says that the law can't save you. And that's not how we're made right with the Father. We're made right with the Father by putting our faith in the Son. He says, verse 17, but suppose so, so but suppose we seek to be made right with God by through faith in Christ, and then we found guilty because we have abandoned the law. He said, just let's just go with your theory. We made right with God by faith, but then go later, we realize, oh, we've messed up because we sinned. He says, would that mean Christ has led us into sin? Because you just said we made right with you by believing in you. But then you're going to condemn us for sinning? He says, that means you led us to it. That means you're responsible for it. He says, he says, absolutely not. He says, whether I'm a sinner, if I rebuild the old system of the law, or toward, uh, uh, whether I am, I am a sinner, if I rebuild the old system of the law, I have already, uh, I, law I already tore down. He said, you can't re-erect the law. It's already tore down. Jesus already, Jesus already paid the price. Like, it's already done with. We can't, and, and to be honest, we, already, we keep re-erecting the law. People, people are like, love it. You got to live under the law. You got to do it. You got to do it, all this stuff. He said, that don't make you right with God. All these laws, all this stuff, that, that don't do nothing. That ain't doing nothing. He says, verse 19, we're going to tie it up here, last two verses. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died in the law. I stopped trying to meet all these requirements so that I may live for God. You can't have both. You can't say I keep the law and believe in Jesus. I accept grace and I got to keep the law. He said, no, 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 it's, it's no. He says, he says, he says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He says, so I live in this earthly body by trusting in the son of God who loved me. Come on, ministers, and gave himself for me. He says, look, I live. Now it's not I. I've been crucified with Christ. My sin nature got paid for on the cross. Now it's not I who live. It is the grace of God that allows me to live through now. He says, last verse, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. I don't just sin and live however just because grace is covering me. He says, for, I, for if keeping the law could make us right with God, there would be no need for Christ to die. If us not sinning makes us right with God, what was the point for him dying? If we could just keep this habit and not eat pork and not wear fur or whatever as the laws are, if all these 613, like if that's all it took, what was the point of him dying? There was no point. We just have, the law would still be oppressed on us and we would still have to keep it and we would still have to live it and that's how we would be made right. Paul said, if that's the point, why Christ die? He's trying to make a point that our salvation is only through to God. Our right standing with God is through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why I wanted to end here because I'm tired of everybody. It breaks my heart sometimes. 
the inside of the church is mostly women. But if you go look at all these false religions, it's all these men. This is why if you're the devil and you're going to walk into a household and destroy it, what's the first person you got to take out? The man. So these religions pull in, they work on men more than women. And they pry on the men to come. And they give them the law because the law is self is self exalting. I, I'm better than you. And since we're stuffed with pride, these other religions make us believe I do this and they do this and I'm the chosen people and black people are chosen and all this stuff and it picks up our pride. And so we target pride or we target black because Lord knows we can't get around our blackness. And we target black. A lot of us make way too many decisions because we're black. And the bad part about it is when you die, get put in the grave, oh my God, it won't matter. Your bones are all the same color. And we've lived our whole life off of black. We vote because it's black. We shop places because it's black. And we do all this because it's black. And God like, oh my goodness, my children are immature. But people have played on our emotions. And that's what some of these religions, they play on our emotions, they play on our self-esteem, they have brotherhood, and they show themselves, and us men just, like, we just right into it. And I was studying this week, and God reminded me some people struggle to be free. I right, says, me and my mentor put up here. I wanted to show y'all at the end. I, dang, I got it on my phone, so I forgot to give you how I was busy this morning. This kid is behind the door, and he's screaming. And he's screaming. He, 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 the door is, he's behind a house. He's behind the door. He's like, ah, like he's getting crushed. And the dad got the video. He just moves the door. And he says, grab the door, put it back, and say, ah, I start screaming again. We like bondage. We're more comfortable living in a place where we think if we sin, we just go to hell and God mad at us, than being free to knowing that that's not the case. I just got to pursue him in holiness. And when I fall, he's going to give me back up and say, come on, son, I got you. I love you. Now I need you to try again. And you're going to fall. He's going, no, 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 I got you. I got you. Come on, come on. Come on, get up, get up, get up. I got you. Because when your baby is on training wheels and they fall, what you do? You don't scream until I get up. Get up. You know that they're babies. What you say? Come on, baby. It's okay. We go, Daddy got you. Come on. I'm on you. You're doing it. You're doing it. Yes. Because God is going to walk us and continue to work with us right into when we please him. But we'll teach that he's just going to throw you in hell because you went to the juke house. It's over for you. To hell you go. Your skirt's too short. We come to church, get a measuring stick, nope, two inches but a knee, you're going to hell. That's not it, y'all. God has freed us. And if you have never gave your life to Jesus Christ, this is the most important part of all of this. If you've never gave your life to Jesus Christ, and, I, and you say to that, I need to come into that freedom. I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know I've made mistakes. I know, and I want to make, I want to, I want to save you. I want somebody who can take that weight off of me. Any man be in Christ is a new creature. I want that to come off of me. I want to give that to God. I want to nail that to the cross of the scripture that said, I want to be free in Christ and now start my journey of sanctification and living for him.